today we're going to read a poem about a painting. And uh, therefore, it would be worthwhile to have not only a copy of the poem in front of you, but a copy of the painting that you can make from uh, ideally in color from pick it up on Google Images, and you'll see soon what the name of the painting is. The poem is a poem by W. H. Auden, published in 1940, inspired by a visit that he made to a museum in Brussels, the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Brussels. And oddly enough, the poem is about a painting, but the title is about the museum. Without further ado, let's read the poem. About suffering, they were never wrong. The old masters, how they well, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along, how when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow, in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their duty life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to do, as it had to, on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Now, the name of the painting, specific painting, which is only an example of something that represents an idea that is to be found in other paintings, in other paintings, especially of the old masters who understood, who understood the truth of the human response to suffering. And the poem focuses on one painting that is in this museum. But of course, if you go to the museum, even just go to the museum vir virtually, even just looking at the Bruegel paintings in the museum, you'll see what Auden had in mind. You'll see it. If you don't look at the painting, <laughs> then you don't get the poem for sure. But even looking at the painting, you'll have to know the story. And the story is the story in Greek mythology. Icarus, the young lad, is in prison. And, of course, he wants to escape. His father tells him, you can escape from prison by making yourself wings of wax and you can fly out of the prison. But be careful, he tells his son, do not fly too close to the sun or the wings will welt. And Icarus is so excited that human flight, he's flying like a bird, he rises too high, the wings melt and Icarus falls into the sea. And that moment of his falling into the sea is depicted in the Bruegel painting and is referred to in what 
Odin is seen in the painting. And it's about a reaction to suffering. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. It takes place, says Odin, when people are about going about their everyday business and they really can't be concerned with the suffering and the torture and the death that goes going on around them. The horse is brought in because the horse, while the torturer is torturing, the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. And then the poet, Auden, goes to the painting we're talking about, specifically, in Bruegel's Icarus. Take a look at the painting. Everything, the people, the things in the painting. There's a plowman, there's a shepherd, there's a fisherman. They all are not concerned with this incredible thing. Do we see Icarus falling from the sky in the painting? Absolutely not. We see his legs as he falls into the water. That's all. And a beautiful boat sails on by. The people on deck presumably saw this wondrous, incredible reality of a, a boy falling from heaven. The ship sails on. The plowman turns away. Nobody takes particular note of this suffering and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing. A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. What is uh, also interesting about this painting is that there is a, another painting by an American poet, Odin, of course, a British poet who came to, came to America, but William Carlos Williams wrote a poem called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And <laughs> there, it's really about the fall of William Carlos Williams. And uh, it would be interesting to compare the two poems. Again, we're in limited time. Okay. The old masters how well they understood its human position, how suffering ranks in the importance that human beings attach to it. Perhaps they attach more to the fish that they catch, to where they have to get to, to where the sheep are, to plowing the fields. And, of course, we now come to what would we say about this from a Torah position, from a Jewish position? How can we bond this and bind this with the which, that which we learn, that which we value, at least theoretically? How can we translate it? So, of course, there are many, many uh, events in Torah, in the Talmud, many laws that could be drawn here, the, the, the range of cross-references that we can, we can uh, bring to bear on this and should bring to bear on it and should internalize it. So let us perhaps begin at the beginning. The second sin. If the first sin of Adam and Chava was the sin a man wanting to be God, and they learned that they can't be God in the creation of worlds. Right? And Rashi says, They wanted to become creators of worlds. They found that they couldn't, had to hide. They found that their insufficiency, no matter what, was that they were naked. So they wanted to become creators of the world. They wanted to become godlike. The second sin is man not being able to be a creator of worlds. 
says, if I can't create worlds, I can destroy creation. And Cain kills Hevel. And what is the divine reaction, which is the reaction we are supposed to, to hear when we harm our fellow being, when we murder our fellow, fellow being? God says, ah, God says, where is Hevel your brother? Where is Hevel your brother? And Cain, being Cain, answers, am I my brother's keeper? Hashomer achi anochi. And of course, the point is, yes, you are to be concerned with the tragedy of the disappearance of your brother. We, at times, injure by, by, the, by the sword, and we, at times, injure by turning away from the sword. The poem by Odin was, was published in 1940. The date is certainly important in view of a world that beginning to turn around to avoid responsibility. And wait, one could go on with the responsibility assigned to Noah which apparently he doesn't manage to bring other people into the ark. One could go on to Avraham, who is concerned with the fate of his brother, as it were, his nephew, Lot, who hears that his brother has been captured and goes off to battle to save him. One could go on with the whole issue of Yosef cast into the boar and whether the brothers heard his cries. One could go on to the story of Moshe who sees, who sees an, uh, his fellow Jew being beaten and nobody, nobody is acting on his behalf and Moshe acts on his behalf and then runs away and comes and acts on behalf of the the daughters of Yisro, as Yaakov acted on behalf of Rachel, but Moshe was writing an injustice. And we have halachos that you have to help your fellow man over and over. And we even have lo tamod al damreyacha. You can't turn away. You can't turn away. You bear responsibility for the other. The, the um, poem written in 1940 makes us recall the observation of William Burke, Edmund Burke, at least attributed to him, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. To do nothing. And uh, nothing that... that uh, Auden, the nothing that Auden is referring to is, I don't see it. It doesn't register on me that something terrible is happening. And just to conclude, the final thing perhaps we should take note and read, particularly before the Yom Kippur, is the Haftarah we're going to read on Yom Kippur. And the Haftarah that we're going to read on Yom Kippur, which is from the Novi Yishayahu in Perik Nun Chet, the, the, the Novi says, talking about a fast, I'll just read in English. Why, when we fasted, did you not see the people say, when we starved our bodies, did you pay no heed? And God answers, because on your fast day, you see to your business and oppress all your laborers, because you fast in strife and contention, and you strike with a wicked fist. Your fasting today is not such as to make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I desire, a day for men to starve their bodies? Is it bowing the head like a bulrush and lying in sackcloth and ashes? Do you call that a fast? A day when the Lord is favorable? No, 
This is the fast that I desire, to unlock fetters of wickedness and untie the cords of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break off every yoke. It is to share your bread with the hungry and to take the wretched poor into your home. When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to ignore your own kin. That is the fast that God desires. And just to close with Rabbi Yitzhak of Malajim's in his introduction to Nefesh Achayim of his father's classic Sefer. He says, V'haya Rogil, my father, who was a man of ultimate loving kindness and concern for others, even into sickness. My father would criticize me because he saw that I didn't participate in the pain of others. His father did not say, you don't try to help others. But helping others begins with a sense, ultimately, of participating in their pain, of understanding, of feeling what they feel, of understanding what it is to be tortured and oppressed and discriminated against, and to go without while others pass by, not seeing their need. And my father would say to me always, This is the meaning of man, of the condition, the human condition. Man was not created for himself, for focus on himself alone. Rock, man was created only. To help the other in the world. The neighbor, the band passing by, the child alone. And may they agree that he is able.